Success is something that Atlas has been getting a good taste of in recent years. The sales of Shin Megami Tensei 5 surpassing its predecessor in only two months, the excitement around Soul Hackers 2, and do I even have to mention Persona 5? While in the case of Persona 5 and SMT 5, those games had the benefit of achieving both financial gain and critical acclaim. Some games, however, aren't as fortunate. A game can sell well, but be met with bad reception. And a game can sell poorly, but develop a cult following. I'm sure you all know where I'm going with this. A good amount of you in my audience are actually pretty familiar with Digital Devil Saga, as made apparent by your response to my mentioning of it in my video on UI design. Shin Megami Tensei Digital Devil Saga was simply given the SMT moniker to appeal to fans of Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne in the West. The actual title of the game is Digital Devil Saga Avatar Tuner. You might have noticed the Digital Devil Saga part kinda resembles another moniker. Most of you SMT veterans out there probably already know that Shin Megami Tensei originates from a duology of games which are also derived from a series of books known as Digital Devil Story. In case your vocabulary isn't very strong, Saga is basically synonymous with story. So if we were to assume the resemblance was intentional, the western title of the game turned out to be a moniker on top of another moniker. Brilliant. Either way, the Avatar Tuner games did not reach the sales numbers Atlas expected, and this contributed to substantial losses and layoffs. Now, maybe the marketing wasn't very good, or maybe it was far too removed from its Megami Tensei roots to appeal to that crowd at the time, or maybe the box art was just so boring nobody thought about buying it. I don't know. This isn't meant to be a research video, I simply want to pose a question based on the information we know, as well as look into the substance of the games themselves. Was Digital Devil Saga worth the effort? I know that might sound like a strange question. A lot of you are probably saying, of course, it was worth every minute they put into it. So in order to get you to sort of understand why I'm posing this question in the first place, I need to show you how much care and thought they actually put into these games. Does the effort put into the making of Digital Devil Saga mean as much without anything to show for it? I'm typically not a very negative or pessimistic person, but something that a lot of casual consumers of media don't fully have a grasp on is that sometimes good pieces of work just fail, and it may not even be fair. The game takes place in a desolate world known as the Junkyard. An ensuing battle is taking place between two of the many existing tribes in this world. The two we are introduced to here are the Embryon and the Vanguards. In the middle of the conflict, a giant egg appears in the middle of the field. So naturally, the first thing the two fighting tribes agree to do first is shoot it. Uh, that doesn't go too well, and everyone, and I don't just mean everyone in the battle, I mean everyone in the junkyard, gets infected with the Atma virus, giving everyone demonic powers. And by that I mean you eat people. After eating all those people, you regain consciousness and discover a mysterious girl named Sarah, who is able to calm your insatiable hunger and stop your tribe from eating each other. Handy. Then a meeting is held by all the tribe leaders at the Karma Tower, which oversees the ongoing war, where a being known as Angel declares that all the tribes must fight over the mysterious girl in question. Only one tribe can come out on top. When that time comes, they can return with the girl to reach Nirvana. Sounds like a much better time than staying in this wasteland, so everyone's down for it. That about sums up the premise of the story. If what I've summarized didn't make the point clear already, the prominent theme of this game is survival of the fittest. I'm hoping everyone watching this is not for killing and war, but what is one supposed to do when left with no other option? 
The drawback of everyone's demon powers being that they must devour each other is probably the best way they could have driven the point across. Because it is truly a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there at times, especially in the junkyard where everyone must literally eat each other to survive. There are times where we really don't want to act selfishly or feel bad for putting ourselves before others, but that's just a natural part of life sometimes. Sometimes what's best for you will be at the expense of someone else. By no means am I advocating for selfishness, and neither is the game. In fact, throughout the game, you'll be given choices whether you can either do the obviously smart thing to do in this type of world, and this type of situation, or you can do the nice thing. On the surface, these choices don't really seem to affect anything, so we'll put those aside for now. What really pushes the story forward is the characters. Most of the first Digital Devil Saga game is dedicated to setting up future plot points and establishing our main cast, so I believe it would be wise of me to relay that info before we talk any further about the grand narrative. This will also make talking about certain character moments in the second game much easier. The denizens of the junkyard are split into six tribes, the Embryon, the Vanguard, the Maribel, the Solids, the Wolves, and the Brutes. Our main cast consists of the Embryon, five of them in particular. Surf is your silent protagonist of the game and is the leader of the Embryon. This is the reason why you get several choices throughout the game to either be the nice guy or go with the flow of the survival of the fittest mindset. Even though the choices don't really affect anything in this game, Oops! Did I let that slip out? I still personally found myself hesitating a bit over each answer. Sometimes I felt really tempted to do the smart thing, and other times, I just said fuck it and chose the kind thing to do just to stick it to the man. Or angel, I guess. Next up is Argilla. Argilla's whole shtick is that she doesn't like devouring people. She has a hard time getting herself to do it for the first time. But as mentioned earlier, what other choice are they left with? They can't take Sarah anywhere they go because as established earlier, she's being sought after by literally everyone. Another character who shares her sentiment is the leader of the Maribel tribe, Janana. The initial plan was to form an alliance with the Maribel to take down the tribe that they were actively fighting against, the Solids. Killing a tribe's leader means that everyone in that tribe now belongs to the winning tribe. After defeating the Solids, they were going to turn on the Maribel so that they can absorb both tribes in the end. This doesn't work out though, because Janana's right-hand man, Bat, gets his ass kicked by the group, and he's really butthurt over it. So he squeals about the alliance to the Solids, and they're fully prepared for it. After getting miserably stomped by the Solids, you find out that Janana refused to eat people as well, which led to her losing control of her hunger and needing to be put down. This was meant to show that there are still good people who share Argilla's feelings, even in a cruel world. Unfortunately, this is as far as her character evolves, and this happens relatively early in the game. Now let's talk about Gale. Gale is the strategic expert of the group. He's the one who comes up with all the plans. He's the most logical one and doesn't really get caught up in his emotions. In fact, he barely expresses any. On one hand, this means he never loses sight of the group's goals and can keep everyone on track. On the other hand, this could be considered his biggest flaw. Plan? 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 How can you be like that? Our comrade died. Comrade? I do not comprehend. Just ignore her. She's just pissed because her girlfriend got killed. What is pissed? Her girlfriend? Hmm. It's not until very late in the game when the leader of the wolves, Lupa, dies. Like Janana, Lupa refused to devour anyone and lost control. He also needed to be put down. However, he and Gale made a promise. Lupa asks Gale to find his son and tell him to grow up to be an honest man. 
It's after this point that Gale learns to empathize with people and understand their feelings. I always liked Gale's stoic demeanor. Even after gaining a sense of sentiment, he's still the most cool-headed. This makes the one time he is most emotional all the more powerful. Be you angel or demon, you will surely regret giving me this cursed power! And I tend to like that in characters. Then there's Cielo. He's a laid-back and very friendly guy. Very much needed and kind of to be expected type of character for the gruesome nature of the game. Digital Devil Saga 1 establishes how much he values his friends. When he fails to protect Sarah and she's taken by the solids, he feels immense guilt and then later redeems himself by saving her. Cielo is also the first one to make direct contact with a little black cat, no not that one, who's been watching everyone from a distance. And finally, I've saved Heat for last. Heat is very quick to adjust to his new power, in fact he smirks when awakening to those powers for the second time, and comments on how exhilarating the feeling of devouring others feels. Even just looking at his victory animation after battle, you can definitely tell he's enjoying this. Maybe a little too much. He's predisposed to violence, but not in a cartoonishly funny type of way. He immediately knows the type of world that they're dealing with here, and very much has the survival of the fittest mindset. Logically speaking, he kinda has the right idea, as much as we don't want to admit it. So another defining part of Heat's character is his obsession with Sarah. Protecting her is his top priority. When Sarah is being held captive, and the captors offer to let her go if Heat kills Surf, he seemingly goes along with it and fights you. During the scuffle, he whispers to Surf that it's just an act. Sarah didn't catch that though and almost risked herself to escape. Thankfully, things all worked out and Heat pulled through for everyone. What makes Heat different from someone like Bat, another character with the survival of the fittest mindset, is that Heat still values his comrades. When Gale asks Heat if he would submit to another tribe were Surf to get killed, he said he would take Surf's place. Even though Heat is very fixated on proving he's stronger than Surf, I don't think he's saying this in an I can do a better job than him type of way. I think he genuinely cares about his tribe. Bat on the other hand will side with whoever the winning team is. Bat betrays the Maribel and works for the Solids up until it's clear that the Embryon are about to defeat their leader, and leaves to join the Brutes. A common trend with all the characters, aside from Surf and Sarah, is that the virus changed everyone. Okay, I'm not a Hinduism expert or an Indian philosopher, so in the simplest way I can put it, the Atma refers to one's true self. The Atma virus simply brings out the demonic data within our characters, which you can clearly see reflected in our characters. Now upon further research, this actually seems to be a very superficial interpretation of Atma, as the actual meaning of it seems to be much more complicated than just the self. But that's what it means in the context of the game's story. You can not only see this in their attitudes, but also in the color of their eyes. This is meant to signify that the character's personality has become fully realized. The Atma virus has awakened the person in them. You might have noticed that I haven't talked about Sarah yet. That's because in this game, Sarah doesn't actually do much aside from soothe the Embryon's hunger with her song. Everyone except Gale feels like they've seen her before. The one thing that is worth noting is that she is the only person people in this world have seen with black hair. Odd that the most realistic hair color here sticks out so much in this game. We don't really learn anything about her until near the end of the game. That said, I guess now would be a good time as any to start talking about Digital Devil Saga as a game. Digital Devil Saga very much follows in the footsteps of Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne. It's a third-person dungeon crawler with the press turn battle system, where press turn mechanics work exactly as they do in Nocturne. 
Hitting weaknesses or scoring critical hits will reduce the number of turn icons consumed by that action. Where it differs is in just about everything else. Demon summoning and demon negotiations are not a thing in this game, since everyone in your party is already a demon. Okay, I know I gave Persona 2 shit for not having fusion, but just hear me out on this. Instead, you revamp your party through the use of the mantra system. Mantras are provided by the Karma Tower and will cost you money, and earning enough Atma points will give that character all the skills that mantra has to offer. Atma points are essentially just a separate experience value from your main XP, Karma. So far, you might be thinking this sounds like an absolute grind fest. And honestly, yes, it is a little grindy, but it's grindy in such an addicting way that I can't really rag on it too much. People these days seem to completely abhor just the idea of grinding. Like a game will make you grind two or three times spread across your entire playthrough just because of like a couple bosses, and people will cry about it being too grindy. Grinding can be enjoyable if the payoff feels fulfilling enough, and with the way the mantra system is set up, it almost always is. I only grinded maybe a couple times in this game, not out of necessity or because I was stuck or anything. Digital Devil Saga is actually a very beginner-friendly game in that the difficulty curve feels more like a normal video game rather than a Mega Ten game. Mega Ten games tend to be harder towards the beginning and then become face roll by the end once you've got all the powerful shit. DDS, however, eases you into the mechanics and gradually becomes a little bit more challenging each dungeon. You know, like a normal video game. Tangent aside, part of what makes the grind somewhat addicting is acquiring the new skills and putting them to use immediately, thus spicing up things upon every acquisition and keeping the grind from getting too repetitive. The mantra grid runs off in different branches. There's a branch for fire skills, physical skills, healing skills, etc. I was always eager to get the next tier skill for my characters, but by far, the thing that really makes mastering your mantras addicting is devouring your enemies. Yes, there are skills specifically dedicated to eating the enemies to increase that character's atma points gained for that battle immensely. There are skills that devour single enemies, there are skills that devour multiple enemies at once, it's such an empowering feeling on top of the feeling of mastering mantras to begin with. There is a chance that after consuming an enemy, that character may get a stomach ache, meaning they will get no Atma points for that battle, and they can't eat again until you cure that status ailment with an item or a spell. This can be annoying at times, but it never happened enough for it to ruin the hunt for me. You can also learn more hunt skills, including a passive one called Iron Stomach, which completely prevents that from happening. Once you reach that point, you'll never want to stop devouring your enemies. You eat, you master a mantra, and right as you think you've grinded enough, you think, hmm. But wouldn't it be cool to have those skills too? Oh, that skill too! Oh, that one looks so good! Skills not only have their conventional uses, but having certain skills on certain characters can enable some combo skills. They're like fusion spells from Persona 2, but way better. A large number of them are very high tier skills that you'll eventually be able to learn through late game mantras. If you spec your party correctly though, you can end up using skills above your current grade earlier than you would with conventional means. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, the skills you learn are permanent. You can equip and unequip whatever skills you've learned and this allows you to adjust your setup to whatever your current needs are. You can have a setup for normal encounters and optimize yourself for hunts, or you can have a boss setup optimized around buffs or pure damage. Although you can build Surf however you want, most characters do have predetermined stat builds that make them more fit for being built a certain way. But when I say that, I only mean that as far in as being a magic guy or a physical guy. 
You still very much have the freedom to decide if you want a character to play a more supportive role or offensive role in battle. It's flexible without being too flexible to the point where all the characters start to feel samey. Then you've got the dungeons. Honestly, they're not the best dungeons ever made, but I thoroughly enjoyed all of them. In a lot of games, I tend not to like pitfall puzzles or warp puzzles, because they consist mostly of trial and error until you figure out the correct and most optimal path. Digital Devil Saga's dungeons do it in a much less tedious way. For example, the solids base have pitfall puzzles, but the pitfalls are clearly indicated by the statues with the glowing red eyes. It doesn't take trial and error to complete, just a little bit of foresight. Same thing with the abandoned mansion. There are tons of warps and pretty much every door can take you someplace random. If you just start wandering around aimlessly. When you touch a light at the entrance of the dungeon, the game clearly tells you which direction to go in. As long as you go to the right section of the house with the right switch activated, you won't have to deal with any of the bullshit warp shenanigans. But by far, the best thing about these dungeons has got to be their aesthetic and atmosphere. Yeah, sure, a lot of grey, faded, or muted colors. It works well for the Warzone setting and the tone of the game. Furthermore, beyond just colors, I found the layouts for each dungeon to be interesting. You go through the bases of many different tribes, and it's actually really cool to see the aesthetic and architectural differences between each of the tribes. The Maribel dress very provocatively and look like gangsters, so the dungeon consists mostly of you running down the tight alleys or climbing atop the short, sort of compact building structures. The solids have a very cryptic catacomb-like maze layout to their base, complemented by the statue pitfall puzzles as mentioned earlier. The song that plays in that dungeon is befittingly called Man's Tomb. Hell, even Muladara, the Embryon's first base, has an interesting structure to it. The city is built in layers, with these mechanical steampunk-looking elevators taking you between them. And who could forget Karma Tower? You only get to see a glimpse of this place at the very beginning of the game, when all the tribes meet up and you see this grandular hall, a contrast to all the other areas in the game. I know having a huge tower dungeon was a trend in other Mega Ten games at the time, hell, even in a lot of other RPGs. I need you to hear me out though, it's actually good. Save points are very generously spread throughout this entire dungeon, and it's a long one. Never at any point did I feel like leaving to restock and selling items made me lose too much progress traversing the dungeon. And again, warp puzzles. Normally really annoying, but you're given a lot more foresight. Instead of whisking you off to a place you have no idea where it is, it's usually just to a close by adjacent area. Looking around at the walls and the layout of the room makes it pretty easy to predict which warp tiles to step on and which ones are gonna take you nowhere. Of course, these are just a few examples, and that's not even everything about the gameplay, those are just the things that I enjoyed the most about it. I haven't even gotten into field hunts, uh, those are a thing, I guess, or all the optional bosses this game has to offer. I only did the mandatory fights in my playthrough, bringing my final playtime to around 23-ish hours, but hey, there's my replay value. I can easily see myself doing a New Game Plus run, and the only other game I've done a complete New Game Plus run of is Persona 3 Fess. That's saying a lot. You know what else speaks a lot? The music. The game's soundtrack perfectly conveys the mood and atmosphere of the junkyard, a somber, doing our best and getting by mood.
The dungeon themes give off the feeling of snooping around another tribe's territory because that's what you do for a lot of the game. And the battle themes are absolute peak. Even the result screen music sets the mood just right. You know what most victory fanfares are supposed to sound like, right? They're supposed to sound like this. DDS, however, sets an entirely different mood. Instead of making it feel like the battle is finally over, it makes you think it's not over by a long shot, which fits much better with the world and themes of the story. So how does our tale end? Well, it doesn't. There are two dungeons I should mention here. First is the Destiny Land Castle, where you hear a fairy tale about a princess who bears a striking resemblance to Sarah and two princes fighting over her. The second is a mansion where you fight Varen, who claims to be someone named Colonel Beck and remembers everyone from their past lives. He explicitly states not knowing Gale, however. Interesting. Sarah finds out the truth about herself and everyone else's past lives. Yeah, everyone died at some point, but they're here now for some reason. Sarah then climbs to the top of Karma Tower to try to convince Angel not to delete the junkyard. After the final fight, which is laughably easy for a final boss, Surf accidentally breaks the device Angel was using to control the simulation they're in, and everything goes haywire. Everyone ends up getting warped off to parts unknown. The game teases you by having Surf almost reach Sarah's hand, but he just can't grab it, come on! Then, in Old Kingdom Hearts fashion, they promise to find each other, and they're driven away from each other. And after the credits, a cloaked figure walks through an empty city and the camera pans up to the big entity in the sky. Apparently, the team felt they wouldn't be able to fit the entire saga onto a single disc. This might sound kind of ridiculous when that wasn't a problem when it came to making the 100 hour long behemoths that are Persona 3 and Persona 4, but when you think about it, the assets, maps, and level designs in Persona 4 aren't nearly as large in scale. Furthermore, you spend a lot of Persona 3 and 4 running around the same places in your town. It's kind of charming how those game structures kind of optimize themselves. Persona Tangent aside, this is kind of a testament to how ambitious DDS was turning out to be. As a result, the majority of this game was used to establish the main cast of characters and set up future plot points. This raises the question of whether or not you can say Digital Devil Saga story is good or not. Can you really say it's good when almost nothing gets resolved and a whole separate game is required to receive any sort of payoff? I know I just compared the ending of this game to the ending of Kingdom Hearts, and fuck any of the people crying that I spoiled part of Kingdom Hearts, but at least Kingdom Hearts felt like it had some sort of self-contained resolution 
while also leaving some questions open. Here though, more questions were raised than answered. However, all of your burning curiosities would be quelled in the game's sequel. Thank you for coming this far into the video. I want to take a brief moment and thank my channel supporters. If you would like to support the channel financially, you can pledge to my Patreon for things like your name in the video alongside the ones you're seeing on screen, behind the scenes updates, and early access to videos. If you like these longer videos, this'll make these bigger projects more worthwhile to pursue, meaning you could see more of these in the future. It would also lift a huge weight off my shoulders so I don't have to worry about keeping up the momentum to stay in the algorithm. These videos take a while to make, and as much as you might say you're willing to wait, YouTube really isn't. The algorithm really wants you to release your next video before your latest one plateaus, which isn't always easy to do. I only barely managed to do it last video. I have also enabled channel memberships if that's more your thing. You even get a cool Atma brand next to your name. I'll try my best to keep the perks between the two one to one. Also, if it feels like I really rushed through DDS1, don't worry. I'll touch up on some of the details I skipped over discussing the next game. Okay, thanks for hearing me out. We're about halfway through the video, now back to my regularly scheduled rambling. So as a sequel, what does Digital Devil Saga 2 add or fix from the original? Only a few things, but those few things actually make a big impact. In Digital Devil Saga 1, if you wanted to learn skills of a certain type, you were required to start all the way from the beginning of where that branch starts, and going down certain branches far enough would lead into other branches. Going back and retroactively learning skills of a certain type isn't that hard considering how fast low tier mantra can be mastered, when you're late into the game that is. But still, it could be pretty annoying with some of the higher difficulty mantra. In Digital Devil Saga 2, the mantra grid is in the form of a hexagon grid instead. Mastering a mantra now unlocks all the mantras adjacent to it, instead of just taking you down a specific path. You also have special mantras that unlock when all the surrounding mantras are mastered. This is spread across all characters, by the way. If one character masters the mantras on one side, while another masters the mantras on another side, the special mantra will still unlock. And it unlocks for everyone. This is cool because now this means you're much less railroaded into a certain path when building your characters. For example, if you're already really far down the path of learning Earth skills, you can easily stray from that path and learn Rakukaja immediately, instead of needing to learn all the other buff skills first. There are certain powerful skills that do require just a little bit of commitment to a certain path to unlock, but you can usually unlock them in just a couple mantras. These changes add a whole new layer into the character building process. Another major change to the game is the addition of Karma Rings. They might look kinda lame at first because they only seem to boost your stats, but later on you'll find rings with special properties that can let you manipulate the flow of battle. I only used the few that I found over the course of the game, but even then I was able to find a few useful ones. The Change Ring allows you to change without using a turn, which is useful for those pesky revert skills some enemies have. The follow-up ring prevents you from losing a turn if you miss, which is useful for users of physical skills that are prone to miss. The pass ring lets you pass that character's turn for free. If you go out of your way to find them all, you're sure to find ways to maximize the use of your three full press turns. Again, this isn't everything. There are still tons of other neat little additions like the Berserk mode, 
and the reworking of the Omoi Kane encounters. Sounds like it's shaping up to be a complete and total upgrade, right? Well, unfortunately, there are no perfect sequels. Even the best sequels fall short in a few areas compared to their predecessors. First of all, the dungeons. While the first game took place in a war zone with lots of abandoned, ruined facilities, and the tribe bases all have their own unique and interesting architectural styles, just the dungeon design in general was both more visually pleasing and more fun in my opinion. The dungeons in Digital Devil Saga 2 aren't bad by any means, it's mostly just the setting of the game as a whole that I don't find as interesting. As the opening theme song states, you're in another world now. The first area of the game is pretty interesting because it's an underground city. Everything after that takes place within the Karma Society. They live in this dystopian looking city encased in domes. As you can imagine, a lot of the dungeons from here on out are more down to earth places than in the first game. You've got corporate building, airport, lab dome, lab dome again, fucking jail. That's not to say any of these types of places are bad ideas for dungeon concepts. For what they are, they're actually kinda cool. Just not as cool as the first game's dungeons. Additionally, the dungeon themes in DDS2 don't hit as hard as the ones in DDS1 in my opinion. But now we must answer the burning question. Does the story pay off? Picking up from where we left off, the Embryon have now appeared in the real world which is not any better than what they had left behind. The sun is now blackened, and any normal person exposed to the sun's lights will get QVA syndrome and turn to stone. However, people who are able to turn into demons, uh, they're now referred to as avatar tuners, are immune to the sun's rays. The only people granted this immunity are people who live amongst the Karma Society, but they also get the privilege of hunting and preying on the normal people. As we've established earlier, demon freaks kinda need to eat people to live. Of course, you ain't having that shit, so you're gonna fight back. The Embryon got separated from each other when they traveled across to this world. So you start off with just Surf, Argilla, and Gale. Ironically enough, this was actually the party that I ended the first game on. You befriend a kid named Fred, who agrees to take you to the hideout of the Locapala, the rebel force of this game. There you meet a drunkard named Roland, who tells you the truth about the junkyard. It was a simulation to test combat AI, which is what Surf and the rest of the gang really are. You also find out that the Locapala are holding Cielo hostage until you do a solid for them. But then Roland has a change of heart and decides to join you in the front line. Cielo is released too, and Roland even infects himself with the demon virus and paints part of his sleeve orange, the color of the Embryon, to show his newfound loyalty towards them. You break some captives out of jail, which conveniently doubles as a meat factory, then set off to the Karma Society's main building to find Sarah and confront Margot Cuvier and Jenna Angel, uh, the bitch from the end of the last game. Yeah, she's in on this too. On top of that, they were able to sway Heat over to their side. I know that's a lot to take in, but I wanted to get the premise out of the way so that I can get into the more nitty gritty details. Digital Devil Saga 1 was a story of survival of the fittest in the purest sense. Digital Devil Saga 2 takes a much more nuanced approach to it though. So the aforementioned Karma Society actually created the Atma virus as a way to prevent QVA syndrome. But as a result, all those infected need to be satiated somehow. Margot QVA wants to use Sarah's power to prevent everyone from going berserk. But this would mean trapping Sarah inside a huge egg forever. Those Margot deems unworthy to live in her society are fed to the rest of the populace like processed meat. Jenna Angel, on the other hand, wants a world where everyone just kinda dukes it out and the strong will naturally survive and rise to the top. Both are survival of the fittest mentalities fitting into the game's themes, but they are different means to the same end, essentially. Do you let one person or a group of elites deem who deserves to live, or do you let nature decide? Something really important that I have to establish is the prevalence of data in this game's story. Data is explained to be the base of everything, smaller than even molecules and atoms. 
A more accurate way to describe it would be spiritual essence. It all comes down to people's thoughts. When you think of it like that, it fits more with the Hinduism that these games take influence from. But Data also works for the sci-fantasy approach this game takes. By making spiritual essence synonymous with something techy like Data, it makes it easier to explain certain phenomena throughout the story. And at the end of the day, we are all basically just bits of data in the grand scheme of things. Individually, each person is probably less than 0.001% of this world. In today's day and age, we are basically worth our data, or how much of it can be kept track of. Also, we live in an age where VPN sponsorships are everywhere, so hearing the word data thrown around left and right in this game is just forever funny to me. Another thing worth noting is that this game is an emotional roller coaster. Every part of the plot left me eager to see what was next, and each time something happened, it had me feeling something. From as early as the beginning of the game, being immediately hunted while running down the streets to the wholesome moment where Roland and Fred arrive with their orange streaks in their clothes to match with the Embryon, to the much darker, more gruesome parts of the story. The game starts off pretty hopeful with the Lokapala rising up and freeing people from imprisonment, but it gets progressively more grim as you go on. You find out Heat has turned on you, which seems kind of ridiculous at first given how he proved his loyalty in the last game. Roland, however, can sense that Heat is saddened by something and must have been told something crucial. Next thing you know, BOOM! They drop an unstoppable monster on you. Long story short, the Karma Society did a lot of bad shit and this horrific monstrosity was one of them. This thing is truly the monster that the story plays it up to be. It's the most difficult mandatory fight in the game in my opinion. Yes, harder than the final boss. Then you get to slowly witness all of your friends die one after another after another after another, and things start to seem more and more hopeless with each passing event, and you really feel for those characters too. While the first game worked to establish a foundation for each of the main cast, Digital Devil Saga 2 completes their characters using what they established in the last game. So now that we're at the point where the characters aren't scrambled anymore, I can go into more detail about their personal journey through this game. First, we'll go over the newcomer, Roland. Why is he taking care of some random kid? Well, remember Lupa from the previous game? That was Fred's father, Greg. Or rather, the Junkyard Simulations version of him. Greg was the original leader of the Lokapala, but on a mission gone awry, Roland fled and left Greg for dead. The obligation of both taking care of Fred and leading the Lokapala fell onto him, and he uses alcohol to drown out his guilt. Sobering up was just the first step in his redemption arc. The second step was acting as a diversion against Meghanada. The fact that Roland held off for as long as he did was impressive. In his final moments, he confesses to Fred what happened to his father, and almost fails to destroy the power plant along with himself and Meghanada. With a little help from Argilla though, he manages to do the deed, and they're both able to die with eased minds. According to Lore, Meghanada. is also known as Indrajit which is the name he receives after defeating Indra. Nice allusion there. I feel like Roland definitely could have been explored more as a character, maybe show the player what Roland's relationship to Greg was. I'm not a story writer though, so that's kind of the best I got. The only thing I can say about Roland is that he's an honorable man, or at least he grew into one, and not much else. Speaking of Argilla, we'll get to her next. I'll be honest, she ended up being the most underwhelming character in the end. She's at first built up to be the most human of the characters in this game, but that kinda goes out the window because everyone has kinda ended up becoming more human in the literal sense. Though, one thing I did notice immediately at the beginning of the game is that Argilla no longer seems to feel too bad about devouring to survive. She even goes on record saying, what else are we supposed to do? A lot of people like to focus on her initial distaste towards Roland, up until the point she came to his aid against Indrajit. After watching my footage though, you could also easily say Gale hated Roland at first too. 
they all gained respect for Roland in the end. The most interesting thing we learn about Argilla is only shown to us after her death. But hey, maybe I'm just not paying enough attention. Now let's talk about the man himself, Cielo. Cielo's wholesome nature really shines in this game. So I neglected to mention this earlier, but you actually have a Team Rocket equivalent in this game. You only fight them three times in the span of one dungeon. The third time, the big guy eats the other two and gains power, and Cielo does not take kindly to people who don't value their comrades. Seeing him cry when someone else dies, that shit hurts, bro. He even has the saddest death scene, by far. Jeez, leave us alone. Hey, bro! your pretty face go, huh? Come on, smile! I'll meet you in Nirvana, ja? You asked for it! Here I come! He and Gale also bounce off each other really well. Gale's not just the straight man to Cielo though. Gale is genuinely an honorable man after meeting Lupa. You see it immediately during the scene where Roland proposes the deal to send the Embryon out to do their dirty work. The peak of his emotional maturity is when he discovers that Fred is the son of Lupa. Gale, the initially most emotionless character, is the one to teach Fred to be honest with his feelings and that it's okay to be a kid. Something worth noting is that Gale was made to basically say all the things that Surf should be saying. He was not in the original draft of the story made by Yu Godai. This actually lends himself pretty well to taking over as leader when Surf is presumed dead for a while. Gale is the perfect candidate anyway with his strong tactical knowledge and newfound sense of emotions and honor. The only other sensible choice would have been Heat, who literally said he would do it if Surf were to get killed, and uh, he's kind of a bad guy now. So it's been hinted throughout the last game that Gale and Jenna have some sort of connection to each other. That's because Gale is at least partially composed of a man named David's data. David was one of the researchers trying to find a cure for QVA syndrome, but later got it himself. At the care facility he was at, there was a terrorist attack. Right before dying, he tells Jenna that she shouldn't hate humanity. But she does it anyway. During the final confrontation, one on one, they end up killing each other and dying in each other's arms. While we're on the topic of death, I should probably further explain Surf's presumed death. Surf, for the beginning, is more or less the same as the last game but things kind of take an interesting turn. So right as you're finally reunited with Sarah, he comes in and he just comes charging at you. Instead of fighting him or holding him off like last time, Surf just takes it and drags Heat into the egg. He's presumed to have died, but he actually survives off the fluids in the egg like Sarah did when she was kept in there. It's then when the cat finally speaks up. His name is Schrodinger, and he shows Surf what his real-life counterpart did five years ago. You're led to believe from everything up until this point that Surf is the nice guy, and Heat is the mean guy. 
So the real surf worked for the Karma Society, who were using children with telepathic powers, referred to as cyber shamans, to try to communicate with and study God. They died. Except for Sarah. While Surf acted nice and caring towards Sarah, he's actually an evil, manipulative bastard. The real Heat didn't take too kindly to this, so he always spoke very sternly to Surf. This caused Heat to come off as aggressive and intimidating to Sarah. Of course, in the midst of all the experiments, Sarah creates a virtual escape paradise with very realistic AIs based on the people she knew in reality. The military, being the military, sees this as an opportunity to use her getaway as a means to create and test combat AIs to be placed into chips that'll be implanted into real soldiers. When Heat brings up getting rid of her only escape will harm her well-being, Surf just shrugs it off and I guess everyone else just took the picks or it didn't happen mentality on this one. The final straw, though, is during an experiment that was putting Sarah in a lot of pain to her limits, and he decides he's had enough. So it turns out Surf was really trying to use Sarah to try to attain God's power and become a god himself. The nurse taking care of Sarah, the real Argilla, also turns out to be kind of a bitch and kills Heat. During the shock of the moment, though, someone accidentally turns on the camera and PA system, and Surf gets hashtag cancelled. You'd think that'd be the end of it, and he'd just get fired, but Sarah was also watching, and her sadness angered God, causing the sun to be blackened and turn people to stone. The real Surf turned into a demon and devoured everyone there until help eventually arrived and killed him. Now it starts to make sense why the AI Surf and Heat act the way they do. They are initially just the way Sarah perceived the real Surf and Heat at the time. To Sarah, Heat was just a big ol' tsundere and Surf was the nice guy. But they've become their own people now. Everyone in the Embryon has. Towards the end of Digital Devil Saga 1, Heat states it doesn't matter who they used to be, and it only matters who they've become now. In a way, him siding with the Karma Society after learning the truth about himself contradicts what he said then. At the same time though, would you not take up the offer of getting revenge on the person who killed you in your last life? I'm not sure all of us would, but it gets a little more complicated in the case where the person his former self was trying to protect is still alive. As Gale states in the game, some people just need to fight to sort out their feelings. In the end, Heat's able to die at peace. He even seems kinda happy to be defeated. Every time you fight him, he eggs you on to try harder. When you return to the egg and see that he's merged with it turning into Vritra, he reminds you that he killed Surf and that you should hate him. Perhaps all of this was just a cry for help. Also, I just gotta throw this out there. Come on, your ass is mine. You might remember the fairy tale told in the first game at Destiny Land of a princess being close friends with two princes. The two princes end up fighting over her, but part of the story was cutting in and out. One of the princes was referred to as the good prince, and the other one who was predisposed to anger and violence was called the evil prince. Given the striking resemblance to the princess in the paintings and Sarah, we're very easily led to believe that Surf is meant to be the good prince and Heat is the evil prince. The game even fakes you out by having a fake fight with him at the end of that dungeon. Oh god, were they way off. The tale is a very direct allusion to what happened at the Karma Society and what led to the downfall of Earth. Although the part that was cut out was never told to us, looking back at the final broadcast in retrospect actually gives you a hint as to what happened, just by listening to the wording when the narrator calls the dying prince the truly good prince. Another thing worth noting is that the final stained glass mural, the prince is wearing black, which is the color of the evil prince statues you see throughout that dungeon. The truth was hidden from us in plain sight in a pretty clever way. Also, let's be real here, it's not weird or hard to believe that this girl fantasized about the only two guys in her life fighting over her. In fact, now I can finally talk about Sarah as a character proper, 
After seeing Surf and Heat presumably die again, this makes God even more mad and the sun begins absorbing the Earth's data. It's not until the end of the power plant where Sarah regains the motivation to try to do something about it. She inherits all of Surf's mantras and all of his stats are added to her own. Gale also lets Sarah take lead of the remaining members of the Embryon now. This honestly felt like a good passing of the torch moment. Surf's not there to be her prince anymore, and she is literally the only one who can convince God to stop destroying the world. At least, that's what we're led to believe at the time. Once you notice that you can't choose the allocation of her stat points, it kind of becomes obvious what happens next. You go one dungeon with Sarah leading the group, and then after fighting Vritra, Surf is back just like that. It's not as bad as it could have been though. When the egg was destroyed, Sarah remembered another facility where she could possibly reach God, and has the resolve to go alone, knowing that this likely means she won't be coming back. But of course, we're comrades, so the boys decide to see her through to the end, and even end up sacrificing themselves. Oh yeah, I wasn't sure where else to put this detail, so I'll just say it here. Sarah is Jenna Angel's daughter. You could literally go the whole story without mentioning that detail and everything would still work out all the same. Also, Angel is both Sarah's mother and father. Angel is a hermaphrodite. Another detail I wasn't sure where to put because, again, it doesn't really seem to matter in the grand scheme of things. I kind of wish Sarah could have led the team for a bit longer, but the devs already had enough trouble fitting this game into one disc. They probably weren't looking to push the limits of the second disc. But now we have both a hero and a heroine character, just like the old traditional Megami Tensei games. Unfortunately, you essentially have two of the same character build now. The smart thing to do is to start building Sarah towards different skills than Surf, as soon as she joins your party. And thus, we've reached the final stretch of the game. So I want you to take a guess what happens after you watch all of your friends die and make your final desperate attempt to reach God. Surf and Sarah die too, but as we've established before, data is part of the natural cycle of life, and when one dies, their data returns to whence it came. So everyone from the Embryon, yes, everyone that just died, launches their data into the fucking sun. But it doesn't just stop there, no. Surf and Sarah's data merge and they become Seraph. And Heat has the strangest boner right now. So remember in the first game where it didn't seem like your choices really made a difference? Well, the choices you make in both this game and the last one affect some things here. By choosing the right choices, you can get special skills for certain characters, and Heat will finally rejoin the Embryon. Honestly, why wouldn't you want that? Your goal from the beginning was to reunite with your comrades, and it's so nice to finally do that. Heat inherits all of Roland's mantras. Because I had all my buffs on Roland, Heat ended up being my Dekunda and Debilitate user in combination to being a physical godslayer. But wait, I'm just under 16 hours. I'm already at the end of the game? Yes and no. Your final challenge, ignoring the optional content that is, is to reach God in the depths of the sun. This dungeon takes up like a third of the game. The first game's final dungeon was long, but definitely not this long. Warp puzzles, damage floors, and annoying gimmicks like disabling your demon form or taking away a press turn. This is also where the remaining optional fights are if you did all the ones on Earth before leaving. Thankfully, the restriction gimmicks don't last too long, and they honestly aren't too brutal. Damage floors are a non-issue since there are items you can buy to nullify floor damage. The only persisting issue is the trial and error warp stuff. I would not blame anyone for following a guide for this. I didn't, and I know for a fact that I definitely haven't explored the dungeon in its entirety. Maybe on a second playthrough, but not right now. While traversing the layers of the sun, you'll encounter the data of many of the foes you'll fight in the first game. I like how for all of these fights, they use a remix of the same boss theme used in DDS1.
You also run into the real Argilla's data and find out that she actually hated Sarah. She wasn't such a nice person either, and yet the AI Argilla turned out to be the one who wanted to kill people the least. Damn, Sarah's perception of everyone was way off. You also finally get a proper fight with and he's as powerful as the story made him out to be. I like when games do that. It's fitting how that's your final challenge before facing Zuckerberg himself. A detail I found kind of weird is that Seraph begs him not to destroy humanity and says that she'll take responsibility, which is weird because literally none of this was her fault. She was literally forced into the situation, but then you realize this is also Surf too. Surf's actions were ultimately the catalyst for God to take action. This has got to be one of my favorite final bosses in Megami Tensei. This fight isn't particularly hard, but it's one of the most visually impressive boss fights I've seen for a PS2 game. The music is also fantastic here. I'm also noticing yet another pattern, first the big towers and now final bosses with multiple phases using every element. Also I said Heat was a god slayer, I meant that very literally, I gave him the skill god slayer and he deals insane damage. And appropriately, he ended up slaying the god. After defeating him, all of your friends are sent back into the reincarnation cycle while Seraph reaches peak enlightenment, allowing them to ascend to a higher plane of existence. Images of war and destruction run across Seraph's mind. It is here that Seraph learns the reason and meaning for existence. One word. The cat turns out to be Seraph from an alternate universe, and they unite to go witness the other alternate realities. We flash forward to an adult Fred watching over the reincarnated Embryon members. It should be worth noting that Seraph was the one to reach enlightenment, not Surf or Sarah, so they ended up reincarnating with everyone else. So, you want to know the one word? Are you dying to know? The game actually shows it to you right after the credits. Shanti Shanti. Wait, that's two words, god damn it! One thing that I noticed about both games is that they revolve around the idea of reaching a higher plane of existence. In the first game, your goal was to ascend above the junkyard and reach Nirvana. In the second game, while reaching enlightenment was never really the goal, you do get sent to a literal afterlife and end up attaining enlightenment in the process. As for Digital Devil Saga 2 in particular, it reminded me of something an old friend of mine and I were talking about while we were catching up. Both the adult Fred and Roland state that the world was going to shit even before the Karma Society did their experiments because of, well, people. The entire ecosystem was already getting fucked. It's Earth's natural way of counteracting the imbalance between man and nature. Furthermore, there's the question of science. There's a particular line that the real surf said that got my attention. Since when did people start expecting science to be humane? To study the body, you cut it open. To study the mind, you isolate it by crushing the heart. Historically, that's how science has advanced. Science can be cruel, and yet we need it to progress. The Atma virus was the solution that the Karma Society came up with, using their fictional form of science but it obviously had major consequences aside from just protecting people from QVA syndrome. I've also heard from word of mouth that this game is supposed to be drawing parallels to modern physics or something like that. I don't know anything about that though, so I'll take this with a grain of salt. Someone else can make a video explaining that. 
What started off as a story of survival and self-discovery also became a somewhat broad social commentary. It's about reaping what you sow. The funny thing about karma, it goes round and round. And in the end, it comes back to bite you. If I didn't already make it obvious, I love Digital Devil Saga. I really needed to rub your noses in these games to get through to you that this game was very ambitious for Atlas at the time. Sure, it may not be perfect, I made fun of a few things here and there myself, but the Digital Devil Saga duology was probably the best Megami Tensei experience I've had in a long time. I haven't been this engaged with a Mega Ten game since... I was gonna say Nocturne, but not even. I haven't been this enthusiastic about a Mega Ten game since I first played Persona 3 in 2017. In fact, pretty much anyone who's played this game to my knowledge says that it's good. The game received pretty good critical acclaim too, and yet, that was kind of a hollow victory in the end because barely anyone played the damn thing. Sure, it might have been totally worth it for you, but would the guys who got laid off after this game flopped say the same thing? I'm sure they're over it by now, but at the time, it must have felt terrible. The reason I'm stressing this so much is because I can't help but kind of relate to this struggle. I know all too well the feeling of putting so much time and effort into something only to get almost no payoff from it. Now before anyone starts accusing me of being greedy for views, I need you to look at these types of videos outside the lens of just YouTube. So the few who do look at your work could unanimously agree that you did a good job, but does that make it worth the amount of energy you put into it? It's like getting an award for participation. Does anyone actually feel any sort of sense of fulfillment or accomplishment from that? Even for people who treat YouTube as just a hobby, the point of this platform is to share that hobby with people, right? Would you really feel like it'd be a good investment of your time if what you made just didn't get through to enough people? I find it so fucking weird that some people act like wanting subs and views is a bad thing? There's a difference between chasing cloud and just simply thinking that maybe you deserve a little bit more or that your work is worth more than what you're getting. You can clearly tell that a lot of love was put into these games, just based on the number of cutscenes. That shit ain't cheap, you know. And yet, the amount of payoff these games got back in return wasn't nearly as much as the effort they put into them. Is the success of a work determined by the opinions of people who consume it, or is it determined by its performance in the market? I try to always have an answer to the questions I pose in these videos, or try to make a case for my thesis. That's uh, kinda how these video essays work. But in the end, I still couldn't come up with an answer. It's a question that's still on my mind right now, as I'm writing this sentence. But the damage is done. All we can do now is look towards a brighter future, and look back at all the fond memories.